So, why not, on a Sunday morning, on an Easter morning, break out some unusual Sunday or Easter traditions? I mean, why not? Yeah. In Colombia, they have a feast unlike any other. And one author said that Colombians are a hearty lot. So the temptation of chocolate eggs and bunnies is non-existent there. They observe Easter by tucking into iguana turtles and big rodents, just like you do, just like John and I do. Secondly, unusual Easter tradition, there are tobacco trees in Papua New Guinea. Chocolate isn't of much use in the steamy jungles of Papua New Guinea, so Easter trees at the front of churches are decorated with sticks of tobacco. And I have to say, I mean, I know that we've done that before. No, we haven't. So um, they decorate their churches with sticks of tobacco and cigarettes instead. Uh, these are handed out after service. There's a thought. Okay, but here's my favorite, and you really have to love this one. New Zealand. I remember watching the Lord of the Rings movies so many years ago, so many times, so often. What a beautiful place, but check this out. What they do to celebrate Easter in New Zealand is they shoot bunnies, which sounds more like a redneck Christmas to me, but uh, the people of New Zealand celebrate Easter by hunting bunnies. I was gonna provide a graphic, but you know, I just thought better, you know. <laughs> Parents can thank me later. So a monetary reward is awarded to an individual who is able to shoot the most bunnies. New Zealand. Get your airline tickets when you can. So here's a question. Going to an Easter message, because like Christmas, each year you think, Lord, how are you going to do it different than last year? And my question that I have, as I've been thinking the last few weeks, is how has Jesus impacted the world? Despite evidence to the contrary, there are people that insist that Jesus is a myth. But myths have little, if any, impact on history. The historian Thomas Carlyle said, the history of the world is but the biography of great men. But what has been the impact of Jesus Christ, which would be a great thing for you to write as you're uh, listening today in the comments. The average Roman citizen didn't feel Jesus' impact until many years after his death. Uh, Jesus marshaled no army, he wrote no books. Uh, it is surmised that he never traveled more than 100 miles from his home, and yet more books have been written about Jesus Christ than any other subject in the history of time. Nations have used his words as the bedrock of their governments. His Sermon on the Mount established a new standard in ethics and morals. Schools, hospitals, and humanitarian works have been founded in his name. Over a hundred great universities, including Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth, Columbia, and Oxford, were belong or begun by his followers. I don't recall seeing a lot of universities being founded in the name of Zeus, or hospitals named after Hermes. It could happen, it just hasn't. So uh, Jesus elevated the role of women in Western culture and traces back to Jesus. Uh, women in Jesus' day were considered inferior and virtual non-persons until his teaching was followed. How about the impact of Jesus on slavery? It became abolished in Britain and America due to his teaching that each human life is valuable, and it is. Yale historian, that guy, <laughs> Jaroslav Pelikan, we can pray for that guy right now. Wrote of Jesus Christ, regardless of what anyone may personally think of or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. It is from his birth that most of the human race dates its calendars. It is by his name that millions do curse and in his name that millions pray. So all of this means nothing, though, if we receive information about Jesus academically, historically, just like learning about Caesar. 
You know, like it's a new category for uh, when we play Trivial Pursuit or uh, if you ever get a guest uh, opportunity on Jeopardy, you know, I'll take Jesus' favorite veggies for a thousand Alex. <laughs> no, my friends, we need to let it sink down deep to realize that just a great teacher or a great prophet has not been impacting our world for 2,000 years. And that's what people say that don't know Jesus. They say, well, he was a great teacher. He was a great man. He was a great prophet. No, he's that. He's so much more than that. Um, how about trying to relegate Jesus to a Christ consciousness? So Buddha had a Christ consciousness. Confucius, Muhammad, and other religious leaders uh, try to say this uh, about Jesus, but it's an unrealized explanation. I don't know if, how often you think about this, but we have an itinerant rabbi, a carpenter by trade, um, who lives a life, and for you and I, 2,000 years later, we're able to have a personal relationship with him, become born again as a result of his sinless sacrifice, and it affects people like, I loved uh, when John was mentioning uh, the Passion of Christ in Friday's uh, Good Friday service. There was a guy from Texas who watched The Passion. Up until that moment, it was believed that his girlfriend had committed suicide, and he ends up confessing to murdering her as a result of watching The Passion of Christ, re realization of sin. Most people don't do that with Hermes. So that's my Jesus. Make no mistake about this morning, that's what this, this teaching is about. Uh, where we've left off uh, since last Easter is the scene of the crime is the cross of Christ. Uh, the women are there. The disciples are hiding. Matthew 15, verses 37 through 38. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mark 15, verses 37 through 38. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. All right, the temple veil was a partition 60 foot tall by 30 feet wide, 10 feet <laughs> thick. The curtain required 300 priests to move. It was heavy and impenetrable since it represented mankind's sin. And access to God was blocked because of our sin. But on the cross, our debt was paid in full, and as a result, that huge veil was torn, and it's important, it was from top to bottom. It was almost, almost like God had a knife, and he cut the veil in two. So in verse 38, when it says from top to bottom, we realize that salvation is a top to bottom proposition, not bottom up. Um, it's initiated by God's grace and not by man's efforts or man's works. So when the veil was torn, God was declaring an open house. Uh, from them until now, the only thing that separates us from the presence of a holy and perfect God is our sin. Jesus paid the price for that. In fact, he says of himself in John 10, 7, I am the door of the sheep. Uh, again, in the end of Mark 15, in verse 42, we read, Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. Joe of Arimathea, probably a person that didn't uh, hunt a lot of bunnies back then, a uh, prominent council member, was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, and coming and taking courage, he went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled that Jesus was already dead, uh, because it would have been common for people uh, getting crucified to actually live Quite a bit longer but summoning the centurion he asked him if he had been dead for some time and when he found out from the centurion he granted the body to joseph so then joseph brought fine linen or the mark uh, chapter 15 took him down and wrapped him in the linen and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn or cut out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb and verse 47 Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, observed where he was laid. Okay, so we read about Joseph of Arimathea, and we know from the Gospel of John, uh, Nicodemus, Nick at night, was there as well. 
But Joseph takes a huge risk in going to the authorities to get the body of Jesus because to be associated with Jesus of Nazareth, that, that could have been a death sentence for him. Um, he was an Orthodox Jew, and this would also make him ceremonially unclean. And so um, this is Passover. So for two accounts, him going into a Gentile house to talk to a pilot, and then touching a dead body would make him impure. But one commentator noted in Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 through 23, he could have been attempting to remove the curse. So again, usually the Romans let the bodies of the crucified remain unburied at the place of death, but because the Jews were so squeamish about unburied bodies, uh, Romans allowed them to bury their dead, but usually not immediately. So when we read Isaiah 53, the famous passage about the suffering servant in verse 9, we see that Jesus uh, would be identified with the rich in his death, uh, according to Isaiah 53, 9. And uh, Matthew 27, verses 57 through 60 tell us it was Joseph's personal tomb. So they quickly prepared Jesus' body because of the rapid approach of the Sabbath was at 6 p.m., according to Jewish tradition, and the Jews did not practice embalming as the Egyptians did, but they had a set procedure involving linen wraps and spices, I think uh, about 100 pounds. So maybe Joseph was buffed, I don't know, but Jesus was laid in the tomb, and the rock rolled in front, and, and just imagine, you've got the disciples, you've got Mary, his mother, you've got Mary Magdalene, you've got all these people that answer my first question, how has Jesus impacted your life? And the stone gets rolled in front of the tomb. Now, they had literally been with the Word of God, walking with him, hearing him, seeing the fruit of the fulfillment of what the Messiah would do. But at that point, they were in a crisis of faith. And that could be you. In our world right now, with a, with a virus and just the way that it's affecting the economy, the way that it affects fear, you can't watch the news, you can't listen to the radio without something coming on. And in the same way, on a dark day, we can think, God, don't you have this under control? And it takes me back to the question that Jesus asked the Father, if you remember from the cross. Because he asked the Father one thing, quoting Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, it's interesting that in three times in the New Testament, we read that the Father responds audibly to an occasion with the Son. There's no audible response for Jesus at this moment what we're going to read about, what the Father's response is. And I say that for this reason. That was a why question that Jesus had on the cross. Why have you, the one that I've uh, spent all my praying to, talking to, especially before he picked the 12 disciples, the one where um, Jesus doesn't speak a word unless it comes from the Father, the one who loves the Father, and doesn't do anything apart from his will. And that perfect God and man combined says to God the Father what you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, never have to say, God, you've forsaken me. So he forsook Jesus in our place so that you and I will never be forsaken. And that's good news. Um, there are a lot of analogies that are hard to kind of pinpoint why we have to have a Savior and a Messiah. You've probably heard of uh, fire and dry leaves that can't coexist, right? These kind of things, okay? So, distance between myself and God and people that are watching this program for however long, um, I hope that you feel that. I hope that you sense that there's something wrong between you and God. And I hope you realize, I pray by the time that this message is over, that you have taken your 
for your request to God in the name of Jesus Christ and make that prayer of faith today. So, up until this time, the disciples had really high hopes that Jesus was the guy who would be their Messiah. He stopped weather on the boat. Who does that? They believed that their Messiah would not die on a cross because they envisioned the second coming. They envisioned the political ruler. They were oppressed. Their scope was limited. And that was okay. We read a lot of times in the New Testament that there are different analogies. If we have faith of a, of a mustard seed, that's enough. And, and God will use that. We're going to see that. But their perceptions were wrong. Now, Jesus did exactly what he came on earth to do. Exactly as he said. So to me, it's, there's some incredible irony if you kind of, in your mind, run the video of the women now uh, looking for the body of Christ. Because the ones that were legally able to give an evidential testimony in court are hiding. The ones that don't have that legal precedence are seeking to do one last act out of love, and that's to uh, anoint Jesus' body. And it's really more to do with um, smell. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. It's a very arid climate there. I haven't been there, but it's right here. And uh, this is a picture of every one of us that comes to Christ, because none of us coming to Jesus Christ has any credibility in ourselves. We don't come to Jesus and say, well, I was good and grammar school, or Father, I, uh, I took care of my mom in, in junior high, therefore you have to save me. This is a picture of these women there um, with sin, with guilt, with shame that gives us the admission into God's reception. So let's actually start the Bible study, shall we? Okay, Mark 16, verse 1. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Now, who here has read the four gospel accounts and have wondered how does this chronology work out? Because, uh, yeah, yeah. So, one again, the title of our teachings here is Simply Teach uh, the Bible Simply. And so you can go to blueletterbible.org. Uh, you can buy it in book form what's called the Harmony of the Gospels. And this will be a tool to help here. I want to give you how my understanding of this chronology. Number one, Mary Magdalene, Salome, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, we know this from other Gospels, begin to go to the tomb. Mary Magdalene, I think, might have been a little emotional, a little apt to be excitable. We all know people like that or the dog that we're watching in our house currently. And so, that's all I can the two of them. Mary Magdalene gets excited and so emotional that she wants to be with Jesus that she runs ahead of the other women. She gets to the tomb first because in the Gospel of John it says it is still dark while she's there. So she's there, she sees the stone roll away, she looks in, but there's no body. <laughs> there's nobody. There's no body. So she runs to tell Peter and John. Now the other women make their way there and then the sun begins to come up. There's a bit of daylight, and that's what it's saying here in Mark 16. So, second event. The rest of the women arrive at the tomb, and they see two angels. Uh, one of them says, uh, he's not here. He's risen. Go tell the disciples. So they go on their way to tell the disciples, and by that time, Peter and John are coming to the tomb. One of them outruns the other one. Which Let's just know that men were involved. And they look in, and they see the body's not there, and they leave. Third event. Finally, Mary Magdalene comes back to the tomb again. She looks in, and the angel says, who are you looking for? And he's not here. He's risen from the dead. And then she turns, and she perceives a man. And what does she perceive him to be? A gardener. Mr. Landscaping kind of guy. And she says to him, I'm sure sincerely with a broken heart, where have you laid him? Where's the body? Jesus says one word. He says her name. 
and instantly she recognizes who her Savior is, risen from the dead. That is all it takes if you will take your heart and go to Christ and say, I, I need forgiveness. I need a Savior. He will call your name. Now, more than likely not in an audible voice, and if you did, you're, you may need medication. I'm just kidding. Uh, what I'm saying is that Mary has the first encounter with the Lord when you put all these Gospels together. What's interesting to me is even though it's not biblically true, what do most people say Mary Magdalene was? His wife. A prostitute, okay? And she wasn't, okay? Now, Jesus did cast seven demons out of her, and how she got those, you know, we don't really get that information. But look at that. I mean, look at a person who has no credible place in society. I'm sure she would have been looked down on, upon in the Jewish culture. She's been demon-possessed. Hello? And that's the first person that Jesus reveals himself to. It's amazing to me. So the women are coming out of love. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they had already prepared the body for burial. The term spices refers to an aromatic substance, uh, a floral scent over the body. Maybe it could even be oils, amber rain. And they are doing this again because the body would stink if uh, in that kind of a climate. So when the Sabbath had passed, it was a sad Sabbath day. They loved Jesus deeply. They had no anticipation like us because they didn't have a New Testament to see the end of the story. And you can imagine, if you pause for a moment, that life for them would have lost a lot of meaning. It was a dark day. Once you have an encounter with God, the prospect that he may not be in your life would be a dark day, okay? They had no presence of joy in their hearts, and maybe this morning that's you. Because this is a worldwide pandemic, which is what a pandemic is, uh, that we're all dealing with. And you might, whoever you are, feel like you're in a similar situation. There is an old Catholic scholar uh, called St. John of the Cross. And he would describe this experience as a dark night of the soul. Deep waters, hard times. And I'm convinced that why the Lord allows us as believers to experience this occasionally, if not frequently, is that it's to remind us of what people who are experiencing constantly that don't have Jesus in their life. We, and we often, it's a disconnect. A lot of times we think, God, why aren't you? Again, with another why question, and he wants us to realize there are so many people today that didn't just worship. They don't know that God has a plan for the life of direction. They don't know the, about the joy and the peace that we get. And, you know, right now, not meeting together with our church family, again, is kind of like that. It's amazing what happens when just at least two of us get together and sharpen each other, not to mention a room full of people. And I think God allows things like this, again, to remind us that there are people out there that don't even know what it's like, how we support each other and love on each other, and the strength of the body of Christ. So, verse 2, very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen, and they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? These women are worrying about a dilemma that's already been solved, and yet we often do the same thing. Uh, the fact that Jesus is alive, it means that he is able to solve our problems before they even arise. And I don't know, I like the narratives in the Bible because I can relate to probably every disciple. Um, how many times did Jesus have to say to the disciples something that was spiritual, and they thought, well, he's talking about the fact that we didn't bring a subway sandwich. So, uh, look to Jesus for your spiritual solution. Uh, verse 4, but when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. Um, from Matthew 28, 2, it seems that the stone was knocked out of its groove. And in uh, Easter uh, services in times past, we'd show the graphic of the great big, huge, several-ton stone, and there's a groove. 
uh, now there are no grooves, no grooves, but there's a groove so that you can push the stone with several guys. But Luke 24, 4 tells us that there was an earthquake caused by an angel, and that's what moved the stone. Also in John 20, verse 12. Also, in case you didn't know this, grave wrapping was actually a common occurrence uh, because of the spices, because of the burial objects. So, again, the size of the stone would show it was a rich man's tomb. John 20, 19 tells us that, that Jesus and his resurrection body could pass through material barriers. So it wasn't rolled away for Jesus to get out, it was rolled away so others could see in and see uh, that he wasn't there, verse 5. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, that's key, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. So John 20, 11 has Mary outside the tomb looking in, but Luke 24, 3 confirms that at least at some point, the women went into the tomb. And the language regarding the robe is specific of a long flowing royal robe, uh, a garment that goes down to the feet. Uh, a much fuller account of this is found in Matthew 28, 3. Uh, Luke 24, 4 says that he had uh, dazzling apparel. So the angel had bling. Bling, the angel. <laughs> now, it says they were afraid. And this speaks of a fearful terror, which is not uncommon with angel encounters in the Bible. But what's interesting is that it talks about them having a fearful terror that actually makes you sober up and realize the gravity of the circumstance. Uh, being, and, and actually being appalled at how sobering something is. So he says in verse 6, but he said to them, the angel, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. The resurrection, I think Mark said this earlier, is the proof that God, that Christianity, that the Word of God is different from any other belief system that's in the world. And you will hear that a lot. Unbelievers will say, well, uh, all religions are, are the same, but they're not. The resurrection proves that though it looked like Jesus died on the cross like a common criminal, he died as a sinless man, out of love and self-sacrifice to bear the guilt of our sin. And the death of Jesus was the, uh, on the cross was the payment, but the resurrection was the receipt, uh, showing that the payment was perfect in the sight of God, the Father. So verse 7, he says, But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him as he said to you. So first, the angel says, uh, come and see, but then he says, go and tell. And uh, this is our calling as Christians. Don't sit on what you've seen. Spread the news. He's alive. Why is Peter saying, wow? I think this is probably one of the great proof texts in the scripture that shows us that Jesus has a personal relationship with individuals. And I'm sure he could have gave a personal message for any one of the folks, right? Uh, they would have all needed encouragement, but what did Peter do? He denied Jesus three times, which means that Jesus knew exactly where Peter was. He knew exactly what Peter needed. And there are times when the Lord will, he will use a verse in a way that there's, I can't, in a human capacity, translate to you what it means when God impacts you with a verse or with a concept. But when he turns that light on and it's personal, it's as if he's saying, go tell the disciples and tell Mark. Go tell the disciples and tell Jacob. He turns that light on in your heart and you realize that he is God and he is powerful and he is beyond any comprehension. And so why is Peter single out love? Uh, Jesus distinct, distinguished Peter because he had special hope, special forgiveness, special restoration for the one who denied him the worst. 
Verse 8 is our last verse. Doesn't mean we're almost done. It's our last verse. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Again, I love the fact that these women, uh, they're the first to the empty tomb, but they were also the last to leave the cross. Hmm. They were the ones who accompanied Jesus' corpse, and I think there's a lesson here. Those who share the burdens of Jesus are the most likely to share his blessings. When the women first saw the angel, they were afraid. Now they're still afraid, but it's a different kind of a fear. It's a purifying fear. It's a good, godly fear. I think a lot of times as new believers, we don't get that. We don't understand that kind of a fear. We think of, I'm afraid of you type of fear. I'm intimidated by you kind of fear. But this is, this is awe. A-W-E. I love how we did uh, I'm in awe again by Dave Morrow. Mark I picked out, I think it was last Sunday. So they've got this purifying fear. These women leave the tomb and they flee and they're seized with trembling and astonishment. And the actual Greek word there is ecstasy. So they're seized with trembling and ecstasy with fear so they fled is what G. Campbell Morgan says. And Matthew 28 verse 8 adds with great joy which is where we're going to wrap it up for this morning. Now, with the one, two, three, four, five of you, because we're agreeing with state mandates, <laughs> we talk about joy, and we understand that. We have probably heard, I don't know how many teachings, there's happiness and there's joy. But we have Jesus how do I know that? What happens to you when you are dry in your relationship with Jesus? What happens to you when you know something isn't right? You may not be able to put your finger on it, but you know that there's a distance there. What I find, if I can get your final attention here this morning, is that when I need to get close to Jesus, I don't need to add another rule or another regulation. That's, that's what comes naturally for me, if you can track with me here for a second. When I think, okay, I've screwed up, Lord, or, or we're not as close as we've been, then I think, well, I'm going to put in this, this mandate. And every morning at 7.53, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to love it. I'm going to walk five miles in the snow to be able to do that. And, and then I don't do that, and then I feel condemned. Now, the interesting thing with the personal relationships that I have today is I don't hold any of my close personal friends, and that's everybody here, um, I don't hold you to thinking of me at 7.53 a.m. at a scheduled time. What I'm grateful for is when we have time together. It's interesting, uh, years ago, we were doing a Bible study at uh, Carriage Square, seeing these amazing ladies week after week. What hit me more than any other common occurrence with people that were there, and I remember seeing a judge there for a time, uh, Joe's dad, is this. A lot of the women would have uh, like a baby doll. And no matter what they would do in the course of their day, they needed to be holding on to that doll. Now, you and I, we think, well, maybe they're at the end of their life and, you know, all their faculties maybe are not engaged. I don't know what we come up with. But I want you to think about something here for a moment. For many of those ladies that I met and was able to minister the Word of God to, they were grateful. And they were grateful for me just showing up. Uh, I think, if I remember, in a 9-11 Missy holiday, just and it's because I wasn't able to teach uh, for that week, uh, just showed up and just read the Word of God, and they were so grateful that they did that. But the one thing that was constant with them is that they're holding on to what would normally represent a relationship, a mother holding a child. And you want to talk about a powerful love in this life. While I know that we don't fathom agape love, we don't fathom sacrificial love in our human flesh for sure. But in the spirit, 
there is a love that will hold on to another person up until the very end of their life and will not let go. That's my Jesus. I want to pray for you right now. Father, thank you, Lord, for the words that you give us. They are words of life. Lord, there are so many of us, uh, I imagine those uh, watching and those that we've come into contact with since 1996 that have been impacted by Jesus Christ. But I'm a little more concerned about 2020, about Jesus today, and about him being in control today. And you might be a person that um, makes big plans about your relationship with God, and, and they're so big, the, the bar is so high that you fail to keep those. I want to suggest to you to hold on to Jesus just like that, that mother's holding on to that baby doll, and don't let go. Because what I'm praying you'll find is that he doesn't let go of you. He will use circumstances. He will use people. The Bible tells us sometimes he even uses angels when we're unaware. He knows your address. But most of all, he knows our hearts. And thank God that you still love us knowing our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.